Welcome back to Pattern Recognition. So today we want to explore a little bit more ideas about the Independent Component Analysis, ICA. And we've seen so far that the Gaussianity or non-Gaussianity is an important property of independent components. So in today's video, we want to look into different measures how to actually determine this non-Gaussianity. So we've seen that the key principle in estimating the independent components is non-Gaussianity. In order to optimize the independent components, we need a quantitative measure of non-Gaussianity. So furthermore, let's consider our random variable y and assume that it has zero mean and unit variance. And of course, we enforce this already by appropriate preprocessing. Now we will consider three measures of non-Gaussianity and we'll look into the kurtosis, the neck entropy and mutual information. Let's start with the kurtosis. The definition of kurtosis is the expected value of y to the power of 4 minus 3 times the square of the expected value of the power of 2 of the original signal. If we have a unit variance, and zero mean, you can see that this simplifies to the signal to the power of four, and then you subtract three, because we simply have the covariance matrix as the identity matrix, and then this essentially gives us just a factor of three. Now, if you have two independent random variables, y1 and y2, then linearity properties hold, which means that the kurtosis of y1 plus y2 is going to be given as the kurtosis of y1 and the kurtosis of y2. And also a scaling with a factor of alpha would then result in the kurtosis of y multiplied with the factor alpha to the power of 4. And now here alpha is a scalar value. Let's have a look at the kurtosis for a Gaussian distribution. The nth central moment of a Gaussian distribution with p of y equals to the normal distribution with mean y and variance sigma square can then be determined as the expected value of y minus mu to the power of n. And you will see that this is going to be n minus 1 double factorial times sigma to the power of n if n is even and 0 if n is odd. So for your zero mean and unit variance random variable y that is normally distributed, we will have a kurtosis of 0. So the kurtosis is 0 for a Gaussian random variable with zero mean and unit covariance. For most but not all non-Gaussian random variables, the kurtosis is non-zero. So the kurtosis can also be positive or negative, and typically then the non-Gaussianity is measured as the absolute value of the kurtosis or the kurtosis to the power of two. Let's look into a sub-Gaussian probability density function. So here we choose the uniform distribution, and you can see that in this case, the kurtosis is going to be negative. If we have a super Gaussian probability density function, for example, we take the Laplacian distribution, then you will see that the kurtosis is greater than zero. If you consider the 2D case using a linear combination, then you can see that we can express our y as w transpose x. Now we replace x with the mixing matrix and the original signals. Then we are able to rewrite the weighting vector as this inner product with z and s. And if we have two variables, we can write this as z1 times s plus z2 times s. 
Then the kurtosis of y would be given as the kurtosis of z1 times s1 plus the kurtosis of z2 times s2. And this can be rewritten using our scalar property as z1 to the power of 4 times the kurtosis of s1 plus z2 to the power of 4 times the kurtosis of s2. So sy also has a unit variance concerning s1 and s2. We can now write up the expected value of y square and you see that this is going to be given as z1 to the power of 2 plus z2 to the power of 2 and this is supposed to be 1 because of our scaling. So this constrains our z to the unit circle in the 2D plane. Now we have to find the maximum of the function on the unit circle with respect to z. So the absolute value of the kurtosis is given by the absolute value of the reformulated kurtosis with respect to the two signals. And here we have a couple of examples for the landscape of the kurtosis in a 2D plane. So here the thick curve is the unit circle and then the thin curves are isocontours of the objective function. So you see that the maxima are located at sparse values of z and for example you find them where y is plus minus si. So how would we maximize the non-Gaussianity of a vector w in practice? You start with some initial vector w then you use gradient descent to optimize the maximization of the absolute value of the kurtosis. And of course you want to do that after transforming with W, so you plug this in here. Then you plug this optimization into the ICA estimation algorithm that we've seen in the previous video. Let's visualize the kurtosis as a function of the direction of the projection. And here you can see that you get this repeating structure in our example. And the maximal direction here is indicated with the red line in the right hand plot, where we see the function of the kurtosis with respect to the angle. Or we also indicate this direction in the left hand plot with the red line. So let's look at an example with a positive kurtosis and here we have a Laplacian distribution and again we indicate the maximum direction using this red line here and you can see now that we are essentially only able to determine one major lobe of the independent components and we only see a small maximum for the second lobe. So you see that it is able to identify independent components, but it also has some problems in identifying them. Now we see that kurtosis is a valid measure for non-Gaussianity, but it has some drawbacks in practice, in particular when it's computed on a set of measurement samples. So the kurtosis can be very sensitive to outliers due to the higher order statistical moments. It's not optimal for super Gaussian variables, even without outliers, as we've seen in the example. And it is not a robust measure of non-Gaussianity. So let's look into some different ideas. And the next one is the neck entropy. So a Gaussian variable has the largest entropy among all the variables of equal variance. We've seen that already. So Entropy is essentially a measure for the distributions that are spiky. Neck entropy can thus be used as a measure for non-Gaussianity and it is zero for the Gaussian random variables and always non-negative. So the neck entropy can then be defined for a variable y as the difference between the entropies of a Gaussian distribution with the same covariance and mean vector and the distribution under consideration. So the properties of the neck entropy that it's a measure that is justified well by statistical theory. In theory, neck entropy is an optimal statistical estimator of non-Gaussianity. 
and computing the NAC entropy from a measured set of samples requires essentially an estimation of the probability density function. And as you may know, the non-parametric estimations of a PDF from samples is non-trivial and often computationally quite expensive. So there you have to use approximations for NAC entropy and there are really ones that are robust and computationally more efficient than the direct PDF-based approaches. Let's look into a third approach, that is the mutual information, and this is an information theoretic approach. The NAC entropy measures the difference in terms of information value to Gaussian random variables. And instead, we could measure the statistical dependence between the random variables directly. So the mutual information is a concept to measure the entire dependency structure of random variables and not only the covariance. So the mutual information can be computed between n scalar random variables, y, that is y1 to yn, as a sum over the differences in entropy. And this is actually identical to computing the KL divergence of the joint probability density function with the probability density functions where we assume that the individual components are mutually independent. So we can simply write this as a product over the component-wise probabilities. So again, here H denotes the differential entropy and DKL is, of course, the kullback liebner divergence. So our interpretation here is that the entropy can be regarded as a measure for code length. And then H of YI is a measure for the code length necessary to encode YI. So if we now look at the H of the vector Y, it can be regarded as the code length necessary to encode the entire vector Y. In this context, the mutual information shows the reduction in code length obtained when encoding Y instead of the components of YI separately. There are also several important properties of mutual information. For an invertible linear transform Y equals to WX, we can write the mutual information as the sum over the entropy of yi minus the entropy of x minus the logarithm of the determinant of w. For uncorrelated yi of unit variance, the mutual information and neck entropy differ only by a constant and a sign. So you see if the signals are uncorrelated and of unit variance, you can express the mutual information as the neck entropy. So therefore, instead of maximizing the neck entropy, we can minimize the mutual information to compute the direction of highest non-Gaussianity. So what are the lessons that we learned here in ICA? ICA is a simple model based on linear non-Gaussian latent variables. And we see by mixing these non-Gaussian latent variables, we create something that is more Gaussian. So the non-Gaussianity is a key principle in order to compute the separation matrix. We estimate this by maximizing the non-Gaussianity of the independent components. And we've seen that we can equivalently use kurtosis, neck entropy, and mutual information in order to measure the non-Gaussianity. So next time in pattern recognition, we want to have a look at the no free lunch theorem and also the bias variance trade-off, which are very important concepts when you think about actually finding the optimal classifier and which model is best suited for your classification task at hand. Of course, I also have some further readings. If you want to read more about the independent component analysis, so there is this wonderful paper, Independent Component Analysis, Algorithms and Applications. And you can also find something about this in the Elements of Statistical Learning, as well as in Elements of Information Theory. I also have some comprehensive questions for you that may help you with the preparation of the exam. And 
this brings us to the end of this video so i hope you enjoyed this little excursion into different measures of non-gaussianity and i'm looking forward to seeing you in the next video bye bye